The Underground Ideas into Action presents An Underground Chat, where we bring the underground conversation to you. Today's chat, an underground field report on grassroots with underground correspondent Katrina Skinner, partner at Burns and Levinson Cannabis Business and Law Advisory, with contributors Deirdre O'Gorman, founder of DX Consulting and CEO of Imperial Logistics, and Mike Kennedy, co-founder and head of product and strategy at Green Check Verified. Hi, I'm Katrina Skinner. I'm a field reporter for the Underground Collision. I'm coming from Denver, Colorado, and I have the pleasure today of speaking with um, two of my friends and colleagues in this industry. Uh, Deirdre O'Gorman is coming from DX Consultants and Mike Kennedy from Green Check Verified. Um, I've had the pleasure of working both with both of them um, in a professional setting and for mutual clients. So I, I feel very confident that these two will be able to share some information and insights into um, the cannabis banking world, which still remains underground for, for many in the credit union industry. So we wanted to kind of shed some light on that. And so I've got some questions we're going to talk with them about, get some of their opinions and, and their perspectives on what's going on and maybe where they think things are going. So Deirdre, I'd like to um, go ahead and start with you and um, just figure out or just kind of understand why do you even believe cannabis um, banking should be offered? Absolutely. So we're seeing most financial institution hang their their comfort level or, or their um, assessment of risk on the, the FinCEN guidance. So back in 2013, we had the Department of Justice giving us um, the whole memorandum, which basically provided an outline for uh, attorneys general on what were enforceable actions, right, uh, for, for states that had legalization on the cannabis side. And so following that, in 2014, we had the FinCEN guidance um, issued by the Department of Treasury that really was trying to promote transparency in banking for these businesses because they want the information, they want the data, and they want to make sure that these businesses are complying with BSA and AML rules. And so the fi- for the financial institutions that are in this space, although the memorandum ended, the, the FinCEN guidance still remains. And that's typically what we default to uh, for, for when financial institutions are approaching compliance and the enhanced due diligence in this space. Okay. And Mike, what about you? Why do you think cannabis banking should even be offered by financial institutions? Well, I think it, it's, um, you know, I'll go sort of a, a, a different altitude than um, Deirdre. Um, you know, certainly your, your expertise speaks for itself, but sort of where, where we come at it from is that community financial institutions and particularly credit unions are chartered to serve the the businesses and the the members in their community, right? And these cannabis businesses are, uh, they're unbanked or underbanked in many markets, and they provide a very attractive uh, source of of funding that credit unions uh, have not only sort of a a philosophical connection to in in terms of these being members in their community and the underserved, what have you, but also a financial opportunity for credit unions to, um, you know, Build a profitable line of business that targets these uh, these these business types, and there is a way to do it in a compliant fashion. You can bank cannabis safely. It doesn't require um, you know some of the the horror stories that you may have heard. Um, we're thankful to some of the folks who have you know come before us, and um, you know Deirdre, uh, you Katrina, right? You you guys are, are trailblazers in the space, um, and being early adopters, you were able to learn a lot of the lessons for our industry the hard way. Uh, and that's made it easier for financial institutions now. And, and of course, that trend will continue. So, um, you know, following the guidance from, from FinCEN and, and some of the state agencies that are starting to be more vocal about their expectations, um, looking to obviously enhance your compliance function overall, and particularly standing up the, the necessary controls for this line of business. Um, those absolutely have to be done. But the reason why is these are underserved members of your community and they need access to the financial products and services that other businesses may take for granted. And you can do that. You just have to make sure that you have the right, uh, the right environment in order to be able to offer these services to, to cannabis businesses. So Deirdre, um, 
like Mike said, you've been in this space for a while. Um, do you agree with him that maybe after blazing some trails before that it is easier, it's an easier path now for financial institutions that are considering getting into the space? I do. I think Mike brings up some some really key points, uh, one of which is is the NCUA. Um, out of all the regulators in the United States, the NCUA has been on the forefront of coming out and saying, we support credit unions that as long as they're adhering to the due diligence, you know, as their regulators be their partner uh, in this endeavor. So, so that really gives a lot of, I think, peace of mind to the credit unions that are entering this space. I think additionally, uh, like he said, uh, the lessons learned have been very important. So the financial institutions that have come before the credit unions considering state programs is also um, is also key because we've been able to work with regulators and work on some issues, I think, that have been anomalies or even as the businesses start to um, become more sophisticated experience that can lend a hand. Space. So, Mike, you mentioned um that if credit unions want to do this and get into this space, that they can build a profitable business. Obviously, to me, that would be one of the pros to getting into this space. What, what are some of the other pros um, that you would see if people are weighing options or trying to decide whether to get into the space? What are some of the other benefits? Yeah, so the, the, the broad strokes are, are pretty clear, right? It's, it's the financial opportunity and then the community security and safety that you're adding by getting this cash off the streets and helping these business members um, get access to the financial system. But there are, there are layers to that. So it, it is a little bit more nuanced. So when you think about the impact to the community, you know, it's not just getting cash off the streets. And you can look at these headlines and, and it's terrible. Some of the things that are happening uh, because these businesses, particularly dispensaries, have been targeted for robberies, knowing full well that, you know, the, the marijuana product is attractive, but it's the cash that they expect to be on hand on the premises that is more attractive to these bad actors. So that's terrible. Um, but then also the employees, the owners, the employee spouses, right? All of these sort of splintering effects that are, again, tied directly to the community that your credit union is serving also have difficulty accessing basic financial products and services based on their interaction with the cannabis industry. So there, there are layers to... Uh, the impact you can drive within your community, within your local economy by serving this industry. Um, but of course, you know, the ROI is, is pretty difficult to, to calculate there, unfortunately. Um, so when it comes to the, the, the hard numbers, the dollars and cents, then you can start to look at, okay, how is this going to impact my cost of funds? How is this going to impact my net income? Because there is not interest fee revenue uh, that's being generated by these lines of business. Uh, is there a lending opportunity, right? Not just from the liquidity perspective, but also direct lending opportunities to the cannabis businesses themselves through some you know, bespoke lending products that of course come with additional costs, but can also themselves be profitable. And then what, what is the average uh, return on assets for, for your credit union today? And if we were to look at non-interest bearing deposits and what that volume could be given your market, does that key performance indicator or another key performance indicator get impacted positively? So it's not just the balance sheet, it, it is overall the financial posture of the credit union can be legitimately impacted by the decision to pay cannabis. Of course, at a, a specific scale and with um, obviously the considerations that I'm sure we'll get to around the compliance and operational overhead that's required to sustain a program. And what about you, Deirdre? Um, what type of pros do you see um, in addition to those that Mike just kind of outlined for us to getting into this space? Yeah, I think a lot of credit unions might not realize, but there's a, a lot of sophisticated business owners that are in this space that own multiple business, not just their cannabis license. So there's some opportunity on the commercial side. If, if credit unions are looking to build their commercial portfolio, whether it just be on the account side, you know, operating accounts or those lending opportunities for commercial lending, businesses uh, are, are pretty prolific. And, and there are some states, multi-state operators, um, having businesses in all walks of life. Uh, so you're really exposing the credit union not only to cannabis, but then also some other market opportunities. And kind of along that vein, 
I, I think one area that um, often financial institutions overlook in getting into this space is not just the, the financial return that you may get, but also the professional development return. Do you agree for, um, Deirdre, for staff members and your frontline employees? To me, once you implement a cannabis banking program, it provides a new career growth opportunity for employees. So even in-house, there's, there's growth opportunities, new skills required, things like that. Do you agree? Absolutely. I think back when I started in the cannabis space, um, I, my head hurt for literally like two years. <laughs> I was just thinking of a new path to develop myself and my skill set. And, and I find that anytime I board a new financial institution, that's the feedback that we get. This is so fun. I feel like I am reinvigorated with my position and I'm learning so much that it really does boost um, the internal um, culture within a financial institution because they're able to ta tackle new things and think in different ways. Yeah. So my, um, what, what, so what are some of the downsides of getting into this space? I mean, you mentioned briefly compliance. Uh, I mean, maybe that's a downfall yep. that you look at compliance, but what are some of the, the cons that really should be considered because it's a lot of work to, to bank yeah. cannabis. So it, it is. And, and so with, with any strategic decision, there's going to be some opportunity costs. So there's additional effort that you'll need to expend. And that means that, you know, whether it's your, your compliance or BSA team or, you know, your, your member service reps, whomever is sort of the spearhead of the program, they're going to have to devote a significant portion of their time and attention to not only building it, but also maintaining it over time. So that then takes away from other areas of opportunity that the credit union may not have the bandwidth to be able to focus on. So, you know, when you're looking at what the next 12, 24, 36 months look like from a strategic plan perspective, know that the decision to make cannabis um, is, is likely in replacement of and not in addition to, because it does require a significant investment uh, of time and energy. On the compliance side, you know, there are, in my opinion, the, the, one of the biggest downfalls of really the, the onslaught of regulatory change since Dodd-Frank has been this growing perception that compliance is a, a must-have, right? It, it's just this thing that we have to do because we have to do it. When in reality, compliance and risk, uh, some of these folks are the smartest people I've ever worked with. I mean, they know literally every nook and cranny of the credit union. They know the regulators' expectations front and back. They know how to navigate both, you know, uh, member-facing interactions, board-facing interactions. I mean, they have this immense emotional and operational intelligence that is sort of put down a little to, you know, that, that's just, you know, that's the engine room. It's, it's something we got to do to keep the trains moving. So being able to bring those folks in compliance and risk to the forefront and say, look, this is a strategic arm of the credit union, just like our, um, you know, our member facing leadership, just like our, uh, you know, CFO, just like the, the CEO, the chief compliance officer is driving the credit union forward. And if you're compliance team affords you the opportunity to enter this space, then you're now able to be more competitive and to capture these opportunities where other financial institutions may not, but it does come with the cost, you know, so you do need to, to keep that in mind. The, um, the other con I would say is sort of the elephant in the room, the reputation risk, another um, very difficult thing to measure, right? Much like the, the community benefit, um, but it is very real. So there is a real risk to the credit union's reputation that their community, their brand, their, you know, uh, how they're perceived by, by their examiner may be impacted by banking cannabis. I'm biased, but I think that impact is in the opposite direction than, than you're afraid of. I think that you're going to get more phone calls when you change the location of a, a button in your online banking system than you will when you decide to start taking cannabis deposits. It's, it's very quickly becoming the national trend that most uh, citizens in the U.S. are in favor of legal marijuana in some form or fashion. And the decision to enable a more effective regulatory uh, framework by way of access to the financial system is a no-brainer, in my opinion. But it's, it's you know, having that communication strategy in place, having those um, 
I don't want to call them, you know, disaster plans, but you know, you do need to have an exit strategy. Obviously you need to have a PR strategy in the event that, you know, the thing that you're trying to keep sort of uh, quiet and, and somewhat clandestine becomes public knowledge, right? How are you going to handle it, it, an inbound uh, increase of phone calls and, and folks coming in saying, hey, can you make my cannabis business? Do you have enough people on the front lines trained to handle those conversations, things like that? So um, the opportunity cost is a con, right? It's taken away from something that you can't do. But I would argue that being able to position your compliance and risk teams as the superheroes that they are easily outweighs that con. And then the reputation risk is another uh, fact that you should consider. But again, I think that that's trending in the opposite direction. I think that there's a positive impact to, uh, to reputation as a decision to bank the industry. Okay. And Deirdre, so question to you is two, twofold. One, do you agree with the downsides that um, Mike was talking about? And um, the second part would be what additional, if any additional cons do you see to, for financial institutions considering getting into the space? Yeah, no, I, I think Mike can make some some very sound points. Uh, I agree with all of them. I, I think at the end of the day, it's it's really going to be uh, up to the financial institution to decide how much capacity they have. Um, when you're getting into high risk accounts, I, I think what what people misunderstand about cannabis is it's a lot more nuanced than working with money service businesses or other cash intensive businesses. And a lot of it surfaces around um, 280E and the tax code as it pertains to these businesses. So there, many of you probably understand that already and standard entrepreneurs um, due to the illegality of, of the, the product in which they, they you know, are in the market for. So because of that, we're seeing um, complicated EIN structures, um, structures that, that are unlike any other cash intensive business. And so if you try to approach this industry um, kind of with the, with the same approach that you've done with BSA and Anvil previously, I think you're going to find a pretty... Um, pretty uphill back. <laughs> you know, being open to um, kind of changing your internal culture is going to be key. And I think that's sometimes harder than people uh, understand because BSA or an AML specialist in-house have always been kind of the arbiters of being conservative, protecting the portfolio. And then when you get into cannabis, you have to start thinking out of the box. You have to start looking at these businesses as a whole, as well as individual entities. And so the complicated structures really, you know, kind of expand your comfort level sometimes. And so making sure that you're on, on board with, with the risk, um, your the leadership is supportive of change, all of those things take time and conversations, but really are important to have prior to starting a program. And then as you build your program, continuing those conversations to make sure that everybody's staying on the same page and are wanting to move forward together. So when we talk about both the pros and the cons, and for those institutions, getting ready or considering this space. Um, Deirdre, in your experience, what is the, the timeline for when somebody brings it up in the discussion start to when you start to implement a solution um, either with a consultant like yourself who's assisting or with um, Mike, like with a green check verified solution, what's the timeline like? What should institutions yeah. expect? Interesting question. So I think it's going to be, depend on a few things. So um, where started and where, how prepared is the internal team to take something like this on? So kind of clearing the decks, being allowed to really focus on this project. Is it one of 20 projects that the team needs to, needs to accomplish by year end? Or is it something that they can do um, and, and dedicate themselves to, to really making those business decisions and launching quickly? Uh, so for instance, with DX, uh, we have onboarded a financial institution as fast as six weeks. And that's meeting every day, making sure that the business decisions are moving forward. Uh, the long time was 15 weeks before conversion in the middle. So, so it really depends upon your timeline and how fast you want to go. I think another um, important factor is technology. So looking at your legacy systems, looking at the vendors that you work with today, and are those going to be able to take um, the ride along with you as you go into cannabis? Or are you going to need to find some redundancies or new vendors to be able to support you? And then from the technology side, I'm sure Mike will, will talk about this as well, is, is if you're going to implement a software solution, aid you or BSA and AML due diligence on these businesses or the ongoing monitoring, um, there's a timeline to get on their queue as well. And so, um, you know, making sure that you feel comfortable with the due diligence in the process, 
building out the timelines for, for getting the technology in place. It can be a, a, a fast project if you have all your ducks in a row, or it could take a year um, in some cases if you're, you're really kind of approaching it more haphazardly. And Mike, has that been your experience as well? Is that a timeline that you're experiencing with your customers or, um, or is it longer? No, I, I definitely agree with, with Deirdre. The, obviously, every organization is different. So you may have a credit union where you know the decision to bank cannabis is coming directly from a board member or the CEO. And that, that gets a little bit more you know, political support, right? People are able to prioritize and meet deadlines and um, sort of work with a little bit more urgency as opposed to you know, maybe it's more of a, a, a bottom up approach where there are existing members who have ties to cannabis businesses, you're getting a lot of inbound requests. And then eventually it's sort of, you decided it's going to be easier if we just build a program as opposed to try to keep these, these businesses out. Um, our experience has been that those programs tend to mature more slowly than the ones that have that top down support where there's a strategic goal, there's, you know, a financial goal tied to that strategy. There are outcomes that can be clearly mapped along the, you know, the, the timeline of going from ideation to deployment. Um, but then there's also this, this window that exists where, let's say we do all that work. We've conducted the risk assessment. We've developed an updated policy and the procedures. We've, we've you know, enhanced our systems and our, our monitoring controls. Now we have to go find accounts. How do we do that if we're worried about reputation risk? Well, we need to be more... Um, more outbound focus. So we're, we're doing some actual prospecting, some sales activities to more discreetly announce that we are willing to accept applications. But then as Deirdre sort of alluded to, some of the ownership structures within the cannabis industry are very, very complex. So I've seen a program move very quickly through, you know, design, development, testing and deployment, and then a very protracted cycle to onboard the first account. Because a lot of things that make sense in the classroom, you know, all of a sudden don't make sense out in the field when you see, you know, a, a publicly traded Canadian company that is filing for the equivalency of bankruptcy protection that owns, you know, these nine different licenses in four different states, right? There are a lot of um, nooks and crannies that can come up and understanding and evaluating each potential relationship um, can be time consuming in its own right, even with the strongest policies and procedures in place. And Deirdre, do you find um, once a program has been implemented and a financial institution is actually taking cannabis related accounts, is it a slow growth curve or um, do, the, do the accounts in the portfolio, does it grow quickly? Yeah, so I think that it really kind of depends upon the state in which you're operating in. And then COVID added an extra wrinkle that I think a lot of us, um, you know, we're, we're not anticipating. So, so the process is pretty straightforward. Um, I would say three or four years ago, you'd have maybe one or two financial institutions jumping into the space. And so you really didn't have a lot of competition. You could onboard fairly quickly if you had a, a baseline understanding of commercial accounts and and had you know some enthusiasm to get out and, and get your, your sales team in front of the right people. That said, COVID changed a lot of things. And, and the industry, um, you know, the comfort level in the industry within the financial services space has changed a lot. So, so now when new states are coming on with new recreational or medical programs, we're seeing five, six, even 10 financial institutions jumping into the space. Um, so the, com uh, the competition is higher. Getting, um, trying to get that market share is a, a little more complicated. And then some states have shut down programs or um, slowed down licensure because of COVID. And so we're seeing just not a lot of people shopping around for accounts. Um, so in some states, you're seeing it still really aggressive and you can get market share very quickly. Other states, it's a little slower. And so you need to build out your ROI expectations and timeline to kind of accommodate what ha what's happening in your backyard. So Mike, um, maybe the million dollar question is with all this uncertainty with COVID and the economic downturn, as well as um, no clear path or um, date for when the Safe Banking Act will be passed. It, um, what are your thoughts about entering into the space right now. Um, with all the unknowns, what would your recommendation be to those financial institutions that may even just, this might just be getting on their radar or maybe there's some that are actually considering doing it. Um, 
what would you say to them? I would say you're not a first mover, but you are an early mover. You know, so the, the first mover advantage and risk has sort of come and gone. So we, we have a, you know, a, a class of institutions that have gone through multiple exam cycles that have seen, you know, program expansion, program contrition that have sort of understood the, the ebbs and flows of this industry. And uh, we can learn from those, um, from those institutions. So, you know, my recommendation is now is absolutely still the time to get in. Uh, the longer you wait, however, the longer the entire market is going to have access to that same information, right? So if we are on the fence and we want to hold out until Safe Banking Act passes, well, Safe Banking Act is going to come with, you know, the FFIEC's exam procedures, which are going to be a roadmap for any financial institution that wants to enter this space to be able to do so more confidently. Now, of course, there are still limitations. It's not going to be for everyone. There are countless credit unions today that don't serve MSBs, and that's perfectly legal. However, if if net interest margins continue to you know, go at the, the rate that they're going, if net income you know, continues to be impacted by you know, our, our reserves and um, you know, some of the other economic trends that we're predicting for the next 12, 18 months, cost of funds is going to come into focus and overall profitability is definitely something that we need to account for and looking for those additional revenue streams is more important now than ever. The Safe Banking Act would be nice. The, you know, change in, in scheduling of marijuana would be nice, but you know, hemp is federally legal. Hemp is still complicated to bank. So thinking that this is some silver bullet is sort of a, you know, a misguided uh, perspective in, in my opinion. I think the time to get into the market is now. It's, you don't rush, you still have to be pragmatic and strategic, but waiting for something that ultimately is, is not really going to change all the that much, except it's going to level set the playing field in terms of access to information and experts like Deirdre, like yourself, like our team. Um, you know, the, the time to, to see that advantage is now, in my opinion. How about you, Deirdre? Do you agree? I do. I think the other thing that I, I just want to mention um, is, is the changing landscape of the financial institutions that are coming into this space. So, so when we started this process, gosh, six some years ago, seven years ago, uh, the financial institutions were smaller. They were state chartered, maybe, uh, you know, 300 million in assets, um, but really didn't kind of get into that billion mark until, um, you know, probably three or four years later. So then you started seeing financial institutions with larger asset size coming in, um, deciding that they're going to start lending. And, and now the, the average size that we're seeing is a billion plus. Um, most of the financial institutions that we're seeing are starting at about 5 billion to 8 billion in assets. We even have some outliers that are super regionals that are 40 to 50 billion in assets getting into the space. So if you're a credit union that is really wanting to take market share, I think my, Mike's advice is sound. Get into it as, as soon as you can. Show that, that member difference coming into your credit union is, is um, their best bet before the bigger players come in and take the market share from you. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's all I have for you guys today. Thanks for sharing this. And um, if you guys have any questions, I'm sure that the Underground Collision has your contact information and mine as well. So we'd be happy to help you, but looking forward to seeing more financial institutions in this space for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks,